What if the most important number in global technology today wasn't tied to a product launch, a stock price, or an AI breakthrough, but a quiet shift in trade data, a 10.9% drop in semiconductor imports to be exact, not a headline-grabbing collapse, not a spectacular rise, just a steady, deliberate decline. It doesn't sound dramatic. And yet, behind that figure may lie one of the most profound shifts in the balance of global power we've seen in decades. When most people hear about semiconductor imports, they think of supply chains or economic fluctuations. A dip in imports might be interpreted as weakening demand, a manufacturing slowdown, or logistical adjustments. But sometimes numbers don't tell a story directly. They hint at something deeper, something systemic. In this case, that percentage drop may be the opening move in a high-stakes transition that could reorder global power dynamics, not with fanfare, but with precision. Semiconductors are not just products. They're the core of modern life. They power everything, from the device you're watching this on to the satellites above our heads. From smartphones to supercomputers, from missiles to medical equipment, from artificial intelligence to augmented reality, semiconductors are everywhere. They form the neural network of the modern world. Whoever controls the chips controls the future. For decades, China has been the world's largest importer of semiconductors. Despite being a technological and manufacturing giant in countless sectors, this one crucial industry remained a point of vulnerability. China could assemble, package, and even design some chips, but when it came to high-end fabrication, it depended on others. On Taiwan's TSMC, South Korea's Samsung, America's Intel, and a global web of Dutch, Japanese, and U.S. suppliers. In short, the heart of China's technology infrastructure was not fully under Chinese control. But what happens when a nation decides that dependency is no longer tolerable? What happens when that nation has both the ambition and the resources to change it? For years, China has been preparing for this moment, not just by building factories or passing policies, but by transforming its entire approach to technology. It was never about just catching up. It was about reshaping the game. And the signals are now emerging. The decline in imports isn't a sign of collapse. It's a mark of maturation. It suggests a pivot from reliance to resilience, from consumption to control. This is not just about reducing purchases. It's about the culmination of years of stockpiling, planning, recruiting, building, and innovating. It's about moving from the buyer's side of the table to the builders, from follower to forerunner. China has spent years accumulating chips, strategically, discreetly. In the background of trade tensions and technology bans, it quietly began building reserves. Stockpiles of semiconductors large enough to sustain production even in the event of future supply shocks. This wasn't panic buying. It was premeditated planning. And if those reserves have now reached the necessary threshold, China no longer needs to import at previous volumes. Not because it's retreating, but because it's ready. Simultaneously, domestic production has accelerated. Chinese chip companies are not just scaling up, they're evolving. Once thought to be trailing far behind, these companies are now making breakthroughs in areas that were once the exclusive domain of Western and East Asian firms. From advanced AI chips to processors tailored for edge computing, China is narrowing the technological gap. In some areas, it's already on par. In others, it's starting to lead. This quiet surge has not happened by accident. It's the result of one of the most ambitious industrial strategies in modern history. The Made in China 2025 initiative didn't just outline a vision. It provided the funding, the policy support, and the institutional muscle to make it happen. Tens of billions of dollars have flowed into semiconductor research and infrastructure. Entire cities have been designed around chip fabrication zones. Universities have aligned their research priorities to support chip innovation. And perhaps most significantly, talent has been systematically recruited from around the world. Engineers from Taiwan, Korea, Europe, and the United States, some with decades of experience, have been drawn to China by the promise of opportunity and resources. They're not just filling seats. They're building new systems, transferring expertise, and creating ecosystems that didn't exist a decade ago. And they're doing so at speed. Meanwhile, the geopolitical environment has done something strange. Instead of slowing China down, restrictions have accelerated its resolve. Export bans on cutting-edge chips and chip-making tools, once thought to be crippling, have only intensified domestic efforts. Every roadblock has become motivation. Every denied license has triggered a workaround. Every sanction has strengthened the case for self-reliance. 
This is not just economic behavior. It's a survival instinct. A country as large and as strategic as China cannot afford to remain vulnerable in a sector this vital. And so it is responding the only way it knows how, by building a future in which that vulnerability disappears. But this transformation isn't merely about catching up with the West's current capabilities. It's about exploring what comes next. China isn't just copying, it's reinventing. Across its research institutes, national labs, and private tech firms, Chinese scientists are diving into the deep end of semiconductor innovation. They're looking at what comes after silicon. What happens when Moore's law slows? What materials, methods, and paradigms will define the next generation of computing? In those labs, the focus is turning toward technologies that sound like science fiction, but are rapidly becoming science fact. Photonic computing. Quantum circuits. Biocompatible chips that interface directly with living systems. Chips designed not just to perform calculations faster, but to change the nature of what machines can understand and do. And while the world watches TSMC's latest nanometer breakthroughs or debates the pace of Intel's roadmap, China may be preparing to skip ahead entirely. Not by doing the same thing faster, but by doing something different, something more efficient, something unanticipated. There are even reports, emerging quietly, cautiously, suggesting that entirely new fabrication processes are being tested inside China's next-gen fabs. Processes that reduce the complexity and cost of traditional semiconductor manufacturing. Pilot lines that use fewer steps, less exotic materials, and more modular designs. If these techniques are proven viable, they could radically lower the barriers to chip production and give China an advantage the rest of the world never saw coming. This isn't just about cost. It's about scale. If China cracks the code for mass-producing next-gen chips at a fraction of the cost, it won't just serve its domestic needs. It will export them. Rapidly. Aggressively. And affordably. Countries that cannot afford to buy from the West may find China's offerings irresistible, especially if they are faster, cheaper, and unburdened by political strings. And that brings us to the most important layer of all, the geopolitical shift. If China succeeds in this transition, if it moves from chip importer to chip innovator, it will not just alter trade flows, it will rewrite the rules of influence. The modern world runs on chips. Whoever controls the architecture of those chips controls the architecture of civilization itself. A world where China supplies the next generation of semiconductors is a world in which it sets the standards, in which it controls the compatibility, in which it chooses the encryption, in which it decides who gets access, under what conditions, and at what cost. And the world may soon be divided, not by ideology alone, but by technology stacks that are mutually incompatible. Two systems, two networks, two technological visions, each with its own logic, security assumptions, and political priorities. For nations in the middle, emerging economies, developing powers, the choice won't just be about hardware. It will be about alignment, loyalty, dependency. And this future may not be decades away. It may already be starting. The 10.9% import drop is not an end. It's a beginning. A signal flare on the horizon of a far larger movement. The era of a unipolar tech world is fading. A new reality is forming. One in which the power to shape the future no longer resides in one hemisphere alone. We are watching that future emerge now. Quietly. Deliberately. Irreversibly.